At the heart of the Christian faith lies the doctrine of Jesus' resurrection. This miraculous event is supposed to be a sign that Jesus truly was revealing God to us, and this is supposed to provide us with a reason to believe that what Jesus taught is true. The rationality of Christianity, therefore, rests upon the rationality of believing in a miraculous event. But there have always been a strain of philosophical skeptics of Christianity who have maintained that there is something seriously problematic about rationally believing in miracles, and none of these skeptics has been more influential than the 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume. In 1748, Hume published a book entitled An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Chapter 10 contained an essay titled Of Miracles, which contained an argument that criticized the rationality of belief in miracles. This argument has sharply divided philosophers ever since, with many maintaining that the argument provides strong warrant for disbelieving in miracles, and others maintaining that it is a patently invalid argument which should be consigned to the dustbin of history. As Antony Flew says, of miracles has probably provoked more polemic than anything else which Hume ever wrote. This video has a dual purpose. First, I will lay out what I take to be the correct interpretation of Hume's argument, the so-called traditional understanding, and critique it. However, my intentions are not primarily exegetical. I have very little interest in defending the traditional reading as being true to Hume. Modern reconstructions of Hume's argument by philosophers such as Robert Fogelin or J.H. Sobel are philosophical arguments in their own right which deserve to be answered regardless of how much they actually resemble Hume's original argument in his essay. As such, once I have critiqued the traditional understanding of Hume's argument, I will systematically move to critique alternative understandings of the argument as proffered by Hume's modern defenders. David Hume's essay is divided into two parts. According to the traditional interpretation, each part of the essay functions as a distinct argument against miracles. Part 1 presents an a priori argument against the possibility of justified belief in miracles. Part 2 presents a separate empirical argument against the quality of evidence for putative miracles. As we shall see, many of Hume's modern defenders object to seeing part 1 and part 2 of this essay as distinct arguments, and instead contend that they should be viewed as a single cohesive argument. I will return to this controversy presently, but for now, I want to review this traditional interpretation of Hume and explore the problems with his argument. One reason why part 1 of the essay has traditionally been viewed as a distinct a priori argument regards the sort of language which Hume uses. Here we find him making incredibly strong claims, such as these. I flatter myself that I have discovered an argument of a like nature which, if just, will, with the wise and learned, be an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusions and, consequently, will be useful as long as the world endures. The plain consequence is, and it is a general maxim worthy of our attention, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. What is this everlasting check that Hume thinks that he has found? Well, according to the traditional interpretation, this arises as a result of a comparison which Hume sets up between the evidence for the laws of nature and the evidence for miracles. Hume defines miracles as follows. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. So by defining miracles as violations of natural laws, Hume thus puts the laws of nature in competition with miracles. One must choose one or the other, as he writes, but in order to increase the probability against the testimony of witnesses, let us suppose that the fact which they affirm, instead of being only marvelous, is really miraculous, and suppose also that the testimony, considered apart and in itself, amounts to an entire proof. In that case, 
there is proof against proof of which the strongest must prevail, but still with a diminution of its force in proportion to that of its antagonist. So now that we have to choose between miracles and the laws of nature, Hume asks a very simple question. Which has stronger evidence in support of it? Miracles or the laws of nature? For Hume, the answer is simple. We have much stronger evidence for the laws of nature. A wise man, therefore, proportions his belief to the evidence. As a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. Nothing is esteemed a miracle if it ever happened in the common course of nature. There must, therefore, be a uniform experience against every miraculous event, otherwise the event would not merit that appellation. And as uniform experience amounts to a proof, there is here a direct and full proof from the very nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle, nor can such a proof be destroyed, or the miracle rendered credible, but by an opposite proof which is superior. When anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider with myself whether it be more probable that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he relates should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision, and always reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he relates, then, and not till then, can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. The basic point is clear enough. If we look at the evidence in favor of the laws of nature, which are confirmed daily by our experience, and compare that with the testimonial evidence in favor of miracles, it is just clear that there is much stronger evidence for the laws of nature. So, since we have to choose between the two, we should proportion our beliefs to the evidence and believe in the laws of nature. As John Earman helpfully summarizes, so here, in a nutshell, is Hume's first argument against miracles. A Hume miracle is a violation of a presumptive law of nature. By Hume's straight rule of induction, experience confers a probability of one on a presumptive law. Hence, the probability of a miracle is flatly zero. Very simple and very crude. Part 2, according to the traditional interpretation of Hume, then proceeds to develop a completely different argument against the rationality of belief in miracles. Laying aside the a priori argument of Part 1, Part 2 proceeds to demonstrate that the testimonial evidence for miracles is of very poor quality in any case. Hume begins by saying, There is not to be found in all history any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education, and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves, of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others, of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in case of their being detected in any falsehood, and at the same time attesting facts performed in such a public manner and in so celebrated a part of the world as to render the detection unavoidable. He then goes on to say, It forms a strong presumption against all supernatural and miraculous relations that they are observed chiefly to abound among ignorant and barbarous nations, or if a civilized people has ever given admission to any of them, that people will be found to have received them from ignorant and barbarous ancestors who transmitted them with that inviolable sanction and authority which always attend received opinions. So then, if the traditional interpretation of Hume is to be accepted, then we have two straightforward objections to rationally believing in miracles. First, the evidence for miracles would need to overpower the evidence for the laws of nature. But testimony will never be able to overpower our own experience of the laws of nature. And second, the testimony in favor of miracles is not of very good quality anyway. It is important to realize that Hume is not arguing against the possibility of a miracle actually happening. He is arguing against the possibility of justified belief in miracles. That is to say, his concerns are epistemological in nature. In other words, 
he is arguing that even if a miracle actually occurred, we could not be justified in believing this on the basis of testimony. There are several long-standing challenges to this traditional construal of Hume's argument. Michael Levine points out that Hume's argument against justified belief in miracles appears to depend heavily upon the premise that a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. But this definition of miracles as violations of the laws of nature is problematic. What is meant by a law of nature? Defenders of miracles must tread carefully here, for as Norman Geisler reminds us, a theist would want to examine more carefully what is meant by natural law. If, on the one hand, it is meant in the prescriptive sense, as a kind of immutable way things must operate, then the possibility of miracles is already precluded in the question-begging definition. If, on the other hand, natural law is meant only as a description of the way things do happen, then the theist can readily agree. It's also not really clear that it actually makes any sense to speak of the laws of nature being violated. If we take the laws of nature to be descriptions of natural regularities, these descriptions are not violated by the occurrence of an event which they do not describe. The laws of nature are simply silent with respect to those occurrences. Robert Larmer surveys the major understandings of natural laws, and he concludes that on none of them does it make any sense to speak of a law of nature as being violated. He argues that it is commonly held that insofar as miracles are conceived as involving a dramatic overriding of the usual course of nature by a supernatural agent, they must violate the laws of nature. The presumption, as we have noted, seems to be that the only way a supernatural overriding of the normal course of nature can take place is by violating some law of nature. If this presumption is correct, two problems immediately arise. First, it is far from clear that the concept of a law of nature being violated is logically coherent. Three major types of theories are proposed as accounts of the laws of nature. One, regularity theories. Two, gnomic necessity theories. And three, causal disposition theories. On all these theories, the concept of a violation of a law of nature is problematic. On regularity theories, laws of nature are universal generalizations made on the basis of and summarily descriptive of what actually happens in nature. Such theories imply that no event could violate a law of nature since laws of nature are understood simply to describe what actually happens. On gnomic necessity theories, Laws of nature are taken to regard necessary connections between events. Again, the implication is that no event could violate a law of nature. On causal disposition theories, laws of nature express metaphysically necessary truths regarding causal dispositions possessed by physical things. On this view, the laws of nature are expressions of objects' essential natures, as in the case of regularity theories and gnomic necessity theories, causal disposition theories imply that no event could violate a law of nature, since laws of nature are taken to express metaphysically necessary truths. But laying this concern aside, even if there were some intelligible sense in which laws of nature could be violated or broken, it is very far from clear why the defender of the rationality of belief in miracles should want to adopt the idea that miracles are examples of this. Since Hume's definition of a miracle effectively rigs the game against miracles, there is every reason to resist Hume's definition of a miracle. As Larmer observes, the claim that a miracle implies such violation of the laws of nature opens the door to Humean balance of probabilities type arguments which pit the evidence supporting belief in the laws of nature against the evidence supporting belief in miracles. Those who accept that a miracle implies violation of the laws of nature, yet who wish to defend the rationality of belief in miracles, even if they are successful in demonstrating that there could be circumstances in which there is sufficient evidence to justify belief in the occurrence of a miracle, they are forced to view this evidence as necessarily conflicting with another body of evidence we are strongly inclined to accept, namely the evidence which justifies belief in the laws of nature. 
It seems, however, that the assumption that divine intervention in the natural order necessarily involves violating a law of nature is incorrect. That it is mistaken can be seen by reflecting on the fact that the laws of nature do not, by themselves, allow the prediction or explanation of any event. Scientific explanations must make reference not only to laws of nature, but also to the material conditions to which the laws apply. This basic distinction between the laws of nature and the stuff of nature suggests that miracles can occur without violating any laws of nature. If God creates or annihilates a unit of mass or energy, or simply causes some of these units to occupy a different position, then he changes the material conditions to which the laws of nature apply. He thereby produces an event that nature would not have produced on its own, but breaks no laws of nature. One could not violate or suspend the laws of motion if one were to introduce an extra ball into a group of billiard balls on a billiard table, or alter the position of one of the balls already on the table, yet that action would alter the outcome of what would otherwise be expected to happen. Similarly, if God were to create ex nihilo, a spermatozoon, which fertilized an egg in the body of a virgin, no laws of nature would be broken, yet the usual course of nature would have been overridden in such a way as to bring about an event nature would not otherwise have produced. Miracles, as events at least partially caused by the direct intervention of a supernatural agent, in no way imply that the laws of nature are violated, since they describe not the operation of natural causes, but the operation of a supernatural cause. There is no reason, therefore, to think that miracles involve violation of the laws of nature. And Jan Cover adds, Believing in events having supernatural causes needn't saddle one with believing that there are false laws of nature, laws having exceptions. Miracles are, so to speak, gaps in nature, occurrences having causes about which laws of nature are simply silent. The laws are true, but simply don't speak to events caused by divine intervention. Hume's defenders might insist that even if we leave laws of nature out of the picture altogether, at the very least, miracles still constitute a deviation from the regular course of events, and as such can be considered a violation of natural regularities. As John Collier argues, natural laws, conceived as explanatory principles, rather than observational generalizations, do not enter into Hume's argument in any essential way. Hume believed we can have no rational evidence for causal relations, merely for regularities that he called natural laws. It would contradict Hume's skeptical philosophy to conclude that he identified causation with these regularities. Natural laws, therefore, can enter into a Humean argument against miracles only as observational generalizations. But again, rare or unusual events which do not conform to a known pattern of natural regularities can hardly be said to violate those patterns. They are merely not included within them. Geisler reminds us, One non-repeatable exception does not call for the revision of a natural law. As has been observed, scientists and philosophers are really interested only in repeatable exceptions to known laws. Miracles leave natural laws intact and therefore are not unscientific. Non-repeatable exceptions to known laws do not change those laws they leave them intact. Larmer builds on this general point saying, it might be objected that the term law of nature should not be understood in a technical sense, but rather more colloquially as meaning simply a well-established regularity of nature. On this understanding, a violation of a law of nature would be an event that is a dramatic exception to such a regularity. Unfortunately for the critic, this suggestion does not reflect, even in a non-technical sense, how the term law of nature is actually used. It is possible to think of exceptions to established regularities of nature that would nevertheless not be regarded as violations of the laws of nature. Consider the possible case of a woman who is a virgin and has a fertilized egg implanted into her uterus 
through a medical procedure. She remains a virgin, and nine months later gives birth. We would hardly regard the event of her baby's birth as involving a violation of any law of nature. One can accept that, all other things being equal, there is good evidence that some regularities of nature suffer no exceptions, and that virgins not giving birth falls into this category. The believer in a miracle, however, contends that all other things were not equal. In the instance of a miracle, God intervenes into nature to produce an event that would not otherwise occur. In our hypothetical case, a human agent, the doctor, intervenes to change a material situation to which the laws of nature apply, thus producing an event that would not otherwise occur. In the case of the virgin birth, a supernatural agent, God, intervenes to change a material situation to which the laws of nature apply, thus producing an event that would not otherwise occur. Both cases are exceptions to a well-established regularity of nature, but in neither case are all other things equal, and in neither case is there reason to suppose that the laws of nature were violated. Some contemporary defenders of Hume fail to grasp how critical the definition of miracles as violations of the laws of nature really is to Hume's argument. For example, when discussing the account of the laws of nature which I have just set forth, David Corner writes, On this understanding, a physically impossible event would be one that could not occur given only physical or natural causes. But what is physically impossible is not absolutely impossible, since such an event might occur as the result of a supernatural cause. One way to make this out is to say that all laws must ultimately be understood as disjunctions of the form all A's are B's unless some supernatural cause is operating. If this is correct, then it turns out that, strictly speaking, a miracle is not a violation of natural law after all, since it is something that occurs by means of a supernatural intervention. It is difficult, however, to see how this possibility can be useful to the apologist. The apologist wishes to appeal to testimony in order to establish the occurrence of a supernaturally caused event. As we have seen, there is no existing scriptural testimony that is strong enough to accomplish this, given the minimal probability that the event really did occur. Corner concedes that Larmer's analysis of miracles, as events which are merely not described by the laws of nature as opposed to violations of the laws of nature, is possible, but he denies that this is of any value to the apologist. However, this is incorrect. The value lies in the fact that an analysis of miracles, which doesn't require them to violate laws of nature, breaks the competition between the evidence for the laws of nature and the evidence for miracles. If Larmer is right, then one doesn't have to weigh the evidence for a miracle against the evidence for the laws of nature. One can accept both because the laws of nature and miracles are compatible with one another. This undercuts Hume's attempt to use the evidence for the laws of nature as evidence against miracles. Corner goes on to say that there is no good testimonial evidence for miracles anyway, but this simply shifts the dialectic away from Hume's argument and into an empirical consideration of the quality of the evidence for miracles. However, Hume's argument is supposed to help skeptics avoid having to actually consider the empirical evidence for miracles by pointing out that such evidence could never rival the evidence for the laws of nature. Corner appears to have unwittingly given up on Hume's argument. Not all modern defenders of Hume are as careless as Corner, however. More savvy skeptics have challenged Larmer's claim that miracles can occur without violating any law of nature. They insist that miracles must essentially violate at least one law of nature, namely the law of conservation of energy. As Joel Archer explains, a related objection to miracle has to do with the principle of conservation of energy a veritable pillar in the science of thermodynamics. For example, William Stogner objects that direct divine intervention would involve an immaterial agent acting on or within a material context as a cause. This is not possible. If it were, 
either energy and information would be added to a system spontaneously and mysteriously, contravening the conservation of energy. There are, however, serious problems with this objection. In the first place, due to general relativity, the law of conservation of energy is no longer recognized as an absolute law, but rather only as holding within closed systems. As Robin Collins points out, General relativity presents a major problem for the energy conservation objection. The problem is that no local concept of stress energy, and hence energy or momentum, can be defined for the gravitational field in general relativity. Consequently, the boundary version does not typically apply in general relativity, since typically one can neither define the total gravitational energy in a region of space, nor the rate at which gravitational energy flows in or out of the region. This implies that, although gravitational fields and waves causally influence material objects in precisely quantifiable ways, their influence cannot be understood in terms of movement of energy through space. He goes on to say, This non-conservation of energy in general relativity is exploited in contemporary cosmology. For example, as the universe expands, the waves of each photon are stretched, and hence the wavelengths of the photons become longer and longer, a phenomenon known as the cosmic red shift. Since the energy of a photon is inversely proportional to its wavelength, photons with longer wavelengths have less energy. Finally, since the vast majority of photons in the universe, those composing the cosmic microwave background radiation, are not significantly absorbed by matter, the total number of these photons remains almost constant, except for an almost insignificant contribution from starlight. Yet each is losing energy, and the energy is neither going into matter nor anywhere else. Furthermore, if the defender of Hume tries to press this objection against Larmer's account by insisting that the universe is a closed system, they will simply beg the question against theism. For surely if God exists, then it is false to claim that the physical universe is a closed system. As Larmer himself observes, This objection fails to take into consideration an important distinction between two forms of the principle, however. The principle is commonly stated either as energy can neither be created nor destroyed, or in an isolated system, the total amount of energy remains constant. It is routinely assumed that these two statements are logically equivalent. This assumption is false. From the proposition, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, the proposition, in an isolated system, the total amount of energy remains constant, can be deduced. But from the proposition, in an isolated system, the total amount of energy remains constant, the proposition, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, cannot be deduced. The latter claim involves a greater ontological commitment than the former. The significance of this distinction is considerable. Theists cannot accept the claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, since it not only rules out miracles, but creation ex nihilo. An essential claim of theism is that God causes the universe to exist. If the universe is conceived to be composed of forms of energy, and energy can neither be created nor destroyed, then this claim is false. The point is not that God could not have created a different world with different laws of nature, but that the claim that energy can neither be created nor destroyed is logically incompatible with the claim that God created a universe composed of different forms of energy. Theists can, however, accept the claim that energy is conserved in an isolated system. They reject not the scientific claim that energy is conserved in an isolated system, but the speculative metaphysical claim that nature is an isolated system, not open to the causal influence of God. Evan Fales objects to Larmer here, maintaining that we have good inductive evidence that the universe is a closed system. He says, if Larmer is right about this, then a theist can feel free to entertain evidence for energy requiring miracles without the worry that she is committed to the violation of any fundamental law. But is Larma right about this? I suggest that he is not. I suggest that we have evidence, abundant evidence, that the only sources of energy are natural ones. 
our evidence is just this. Whenever we are able to balance the books on the energy and momentum of a physical system and find an increase or decrease, and we look hard enough for physical explanations of that increase or decrease, we find one. There is no case in which, given sufficient understanding of a system, we have failed to find such a physical explanation. However, Fales is simply wrong about this, at least on a cosmic scale, since, as already noted, the vast majority of photons in the universe are losing energy which is not being absorbed by matter. Furthermore, Fales appears to be begging the question against all putative examples of miracles inasmuch as he claims that we will always be able to find a physical source of energy when we look hard enough. But purported examples of miracles are thought to be such precisely because we are not able to identify a physical source for them. As Larmer points out, Fales appears to commit the fallacy of division inasmuch as he seems to argue that because the class of non-miraculous events is inevitably larger than the class of miraculous events, that the likelihood that a particular event is non-miraculous will always be greater than the likelihood that it was miraculous. It is true that the class of physical events, which can be explained in terms of the operation of physical causes, will be much larger than the class of miracles, that is to say, events arising from divine intervention. It is clear, however, that the numerical size of a class of events has little to do with the probability that a particular member of that class has or has not occurred. Fales also appears to beg the question of whether miracles actually occur. One cannot endorse naturalism on the basis that there are no events which require supernatural explanation and then reject reports of miracles on the grounds that the occurrence of such events is inconsistent with the truth of naturalism. To conclude this section then, we have seen that Hume's definition of miracles as violations of the laws of nature is problematic on many fronts. We may summarize these problems as follows. It is unclear what Hume means by a law of nature. On any interpretation of a law of nature, it makes little sense to speak of it being violated. Even if this were intelligible, there is no need to think of miracles as being violations of laws of nature. And finally, miracles do not entail a violation of the conservation of energy once it has been properly understood. Having detailed numerous problems with Hume's definition of a miracle, let me propose an alternative definition. I am quite drawn to Timothy and Lydia McGrew's analysis of a miracle, which they explain as follows. For our purposes, it suffices to stipulate that a miracle is a specific event that would not have happened if only the natural order had been operating, where the natural order is understood to involve physical entities, their interactions, and the actions and interactions of animals, humans, and beings with powers much like ours. There is some vagueness in this definition, particularly with respect to what powers much like ours might amount to, but it has the merit of avoiding semantic questions about what constitutes a physical law and whether a physical law cannot, by definition, be violated. One further aspect of a miracle which I take to be important is that they are supposed to serve a distinctly epistemic role by functioning as divine signs. This aspect is, unfortunately, not captured in McGrew and McGrew's definition. Fortunately, Larmer does include it within his definition of a miracle, saying, A miracle may be defined as an unusual and religiously significant event which reveals and furthers God's purposes, is beyond the power of physical nature to produce, and is caused by an agent who transcends physical nature. We conclude that miracles must be somewhat rare events in order to serve their purpose as being signs from God. But just here, we run up against the real point of Hume's argument. Since miracles are necessarily quite rare events, we cannot have as much evidence for them as we do for regular events. So it follows that the evidence for regular events must always be stronger than the evidence for miracles. And since a wise person proportions their belief to the evidence, we should always prefer the idea that a regular event has occurred rather than a miraculous event. The key problem here is that it simply does not follow from the premise that we have more evidence for regular events in general, that we will have more evidence for any particular events being regular. 
we have much more evidence that people die per year from unintentional injuries, suicide, and medical conditions than die as the result of homicide. Nevertheless, it would be absurd to infer that every time we find a corpse, it must have died as the result of unintentional injury, suicide, or a medical condition, as opposed to homicide, just because homicide is less common. The evidence pertinent to any particular case may greatly favor a rare or unusual event having happened, despite the fact that there is, in general, more evidence for a different type of event. As Geisler points out, allowing theoretical mathematical probability to outweigh the actual evidence of the present is a very unwise thing to do. The chances of one person being dealt a perfect hand of bridge have been computed at 1 in 635,013,559,600. But a wise person ought not allow these mathematical odds against it happening to take precedence over the testimony of four sane, sober, honest, and intelligent eyewitnesses who saw the perfect hand dealt. In like manner, the wise person does not allow antecedent regularity in nature to outweigh consequent evidence for an irregular event. The probability based on the past should never take precedence over the evidence of the present. Taken to its logical conclusion, Hume's reasoning here would rule out any future discoveries because we would have no previous experience of them. We could never infer anything to have happened for which there was no precedent. This would render science impossible. As Ehrman argues, Hume's straight rule of induction is both descriptively inadequate to actual scientific practice, and it is stultifying to scientific inquiry. Among the zillions of protons observed by particle physicists, none has been verified to decay. But particle physicists do not assign a probability of one to the proposition that the next proton to be observed will not decay, and they certainly do not think that they have adequate inductive grounds for probabilistic certainty with respect to the general proposition that no proton ever decays. Otherwise, the expenditure of time and money on experiments to detect proton decay would be inexplicable. What's more, not only does Hume's reasoning here rule out future discoveries, but it also has the paradoxical implication that one ought not believe that a miracle has occurred, even if one has. To the extent that a theory of knowledge is supposed to help us gain beliefs about facts, if a theory implies that we shouldn't believe a fact, we have reason to suspect that it is a flawed theory of knowledge. Again, Geisler says, If Hume is right that past regularity rules out belief in a singularity, then Hume is insisting that one not believe in a singular event that has happened. Surely there is something wrong with a theory that insists in advance that one should not accept a fact. Clearly there is something rotten at the core when it would deny a fact that has occurred. Perhaps the defender of Hume will try to avoid some of these difficulties by allowing for rare events to be known just as long as there is some sort of experiential precedent no matter how infrequent, for their having happened. But there is no experiential precedent for miracles, and, therefore, we cannot infer that one has occurred. But a question arises here. Whose experience can set the precedent? Those of all human beings collectively, or just those of the individual himself? If the former, then the defender of Hume is patently begging the question against all the individuals who have claimed to experience miracles. Their testimonies may only be discounted if it is already known that miracles do not occur. If the latter, then a much more far-ranging version of skepticism arises for the defender of Hume than mere skepticism of miracles. For if one may only use their own individual experiences to determine what sorts of events they may justifiably believe, then they can no longer depend upon the testimony of scientists to tell them about natural phenomenon which they themselves have not experienced. Given this dilemma, the defender of Hume could try to loosen the requirement to say not that one's options are rigidly limited by their own experiences, but only by the type of experiences which they have had. So even if, for example, one has no direct experience of a giant squid, they still have experience of aquatic animals more generally 
and so it need not be irrational for them to believe someone's testimony on this matter. But this move invites a further problem. How broadly or narrowly is a type of experience being understood? Because every single event becomes unique if it is defined in sufficient detail. For example, there cannot be any past experience of me eating a 5.3 ounce chicken sandwich at precisely 1.32 p.m. of tomorrow's date. One can broaden this type of event to allow for past experiences by saying that it will just be categorized under the class of events of people eating sandwiches and we have experiences of that. But then the Defender of Miracles can make the same move by broadening miraculous events to just categorizing them under the class of an agent's making a decision. After all, miracles are just God, an agent, making a decision. So if the skeptic starts trying to restrict our candidate explanations for any given event to the type of experiences which we have had, it is no longer clear that he can disallow appeals to miraculous events. As Larmer points out, my argument then is that miracles are, in an important sense, analogous to acts of human agents. Thus, if a human agent may act in such a way as to produce an exception to a regularity of nature, which, in the absence of action on the part of some agent, would admit of no exception, it seems reasonable to suppose that a divine agent might act similarly. It follows that if a human agent need not violate any laws of nature in producing an event which is an exception to a well-established regularity of nature, then neither need a divine agent violate any laws of nature in producing such an event. The critic might reply that, if the notion of agency implies that agents in some way stand outside physical processes, yet act in such a way as to influence physical processes, this suggests that interactionism is a correct theory of the mind-body relation. Surely such a theory of mind-body interaction is difficult to defend. The critic is quite right to suggest that, in the final analysis, the question of miracles cannot be considered in isolation from a number of other important philosophical issues. There are links between the concept of miracles and the mind-body problem. And while I do not propose to set forth my position on this latter issue, it is my view that ordinary human actions, no less than miracles, disconfirm physicalism. Continuing to assume, as we have been, the traditional interpretation of Hume's argument, in part two, Hume begins to develop a distinct and separate argument from the one he detailed in part one. Whereas the argument in part one was intended to a priori rule out the possibility of justifiably believing in miracles, part two argues that even if one could be justified in believing in miracles, in fact, the evidence for miracles is quite insufficient to actually justify such beliefs. Hume makes four distinct arguments on this front. First, he objects that the testimony to miracles usually comes from questionable sources. He writes, For first, there is not to be found in all history any miracle attested by a sufficient number of men of such unquestioned good sense, education, and learning as to secure us against all delusion in themselves, of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive others, of such credit and reputation in the eyes of mankind as to have a great deal to lose in case of their being detected in any falsehood, and at the same time attesting facts performed in such a public manner and in so celebrated a part of the world as to render the detection unavoidable, all which circumstances are requisite to give us a full assurance in the testimony of men. Now Hume is not putting forth an entirely unreasonable standard for rationally believing in a miracle here, but of course, the defender of Jesus' resurrection, for example, will simply reject Hume's claim that there are no examples of testimony to miracles which meet this requirement. Christian apologists have offered detailed arguments for the reliability and independence of multiple witnesses to the resurrected Jesus, for their credibility, and for their willingness to endure intense persecution for their faith. Hume never engages with these sorts of arguments, and so it is difficult to take seriously his claim that this sort of witness does not exist for any miracle. 
As Francis Beckwith says, it is well worth mentioning that some of the latest scholarship lends support to the contention that the crowning miracle of Christian theism, the resurrection of Jesus, seems to fulfill Hume's first criterion. Considering that it is acknowledged that Hume's argument is implicitly directed at the miracles of Christianity, the above point and subsequent observations about Hume's argument and the Christian miracles should not be overlooked. Second, Hume asserts that the many instances of forged miracles and prophecies and supernatural events which, in all ages, have either been detected by contrary evidence or which detect themselves by their absurdity prove sufficiently the strong propensity of mankind to the extraordinary and the marvelous and ought reasonably to beget a suspicion against all relations of this kind. This is our natural way of thinking, even with regard to the most common and most credible events. Hume is here drawing attention to the fact that humans have a proclivity to make unwarranted leaps in logic to conclude that miracles have happened. Certainly the defender of miracles can agree with Hume on this fact, but the mere fact that humans have a propensity to make hasty inferences to miracles hardly allows Hume to generalize this to all miracle claims. Again, Beckwith is right when he says, However, if an alleged miracle does not have any of the earmarks of exaggeration, there is no prima facie reason to discount the reality of that miracle on the basis of any analogy to like events, i.e., there is no positive analogy. After all, you cannot assume that all miracle claims are involved in exaggeration unless you already know that miracles never occur. And the only way we can have good reason to believe that a particular miracle claim is a product of exaggeration, and hence did not take place, is if the evidence, or the lack thereof, tends to confirm this fact. That is, we know enough about a particular case, and cases analogous to it, to make this judgment. Therefore, the claim that exaggeration is always involved in miracle claims, without seeing whether in fact a positive analogy is actually present, is to beg the question in favor of naturalism. This human propensity to exaggerate should certainly motivate us to be careful before accepting any testimony about a miracle. We should make sure that a person who testifies to a miracle is warranted in concluding that they have witnessed one. There should be reasons for thinking that there is a relation of correspondence between their experiences and their testimony. But again, the Christian apologist will want to maintain that this condition is met in the case of the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Furthermore, the Christian apologist will want to maintain that certain individuals, such as the Apostle Paul, do not appear to have been predisposed to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, which mitigates against the idea that their belief in it was due to fanciful thinking, as Hume suggests. Third, Hume claims that, it forms a strong presumption against all supernatural and miraculous relations that they are observed chiefly to abound among ignorant and barbarous nations, or if a civilized people has ever given admission to any of them, that people will be found to have received them from ignorant and barbarous ancestors who transmitted them with that inviolable sanction and authority which always attend received opinions. Now in the first place, Surely the fact that most reports of miracles occur within uncivilized cultures cannot form a presumption against all miracle reports, including those from within civilized cultures. To the extent that the lack of civilization in which a miracle report originates counts against it, by the same measure, the degree of civilization in which a miracle report originates must count in its favor, and once again, the Christian apologist will want to maintain that reports regarding a miracle, such as the resurrection of Jesus, originated from Paul and the authors of the Gospels, who are certainly not uncivilized or uneducated individuals. Furthermore, we know for a fact that the culture in which they preached this message was not predisposed to believe in miracles, since Christianity was initially persecuted. As a further point, Hume also seems guilty of a combination of ad hominem and hasty generalization fallacies. As Beckwith observes, Hume commits the informal fallacy argumentum ad hominem, an argument in which we attack the person with whom we're contesting 
and not the person's argument. Without disproving the veracity of a particular testimony to the miraculous, Hume attacks the person who is testifying. This person should not be believed because he is not a modern person. Although Hume accurately points out in his examples that some people in certain ages tended to believe in miracles more than some people in other ages, one cannot deduce from this that all the people in a particular age were therefore gullible and believed in miracles on an insufficient basis. Furthermore, one could alternatively attack the modern age as being so bent on naturalism that it has become closed-minded to the supernatural. Chronological snobbery cuts both ways. Therefore, each miracle claim must be examined individually apart from any ad hominem generalizations. Lastly, Hume objects that there is no testimony for any, even those which have not been expressly detected, that is not opposed by an infinite number of witnesses, so that not only the miracle destroys the credit of testimony, but the testimony destroys itself. Every miracle, therefore, pretended to have been wrought in any of these religions, and all of them abound in miracles, as its direct scope is to establish the particular system to which it is attributed, so has it the same force, though more indirectly, to overthrow every other system. In destroying a rival system, it likewise destroys the credit of those miracles on which that system was established. In other words, Hume takes it that miracle claims within different religions cancel each other out. Now even on its surface, this argument would not allow Hume to conclude that miracles have not occurred. At best, it would cast doubt on their religious significance and create some difficulty in determining their cause. As Beckwith points out, on the other hand, this does not mean that any one of these anomalous events did not occur or that a disembodied rational being may not have brought about any one of them. That is, it may be that the gods of two different religions may both exist and are responsible for miracles within their own respective spheres. Therefore, at most, this criterion is saying that there may be something wrong with our explanations for these events, not that these events have not occurred. But more fundamentally, and most obviously, it is simply untrue that all miracle claims have the same evidential force. For example, if the earliest reports of a miracle date to centuries after its supposed occurrence, then they clearly lack the same sort of merit as miracle claims which date to within living memory of when the miracle is supposed to have happened. As Larmer observes, Hume simply assumes that all miracle reports in different religions are on an equal evidential footing and thus cancel out one another. Hume would have to show that all religions include equally credible miracle claims in order to try to urge the point that they all cancel each other out. Second, Hume incorrectly assumes that all miracles supply equal confirmation for religious doctrines, but this is just not so. Certainly God could perform miracles for people within false religions, as long as those miracles are not confirming any of the false doctrines within them. Now someone might wonder, if you admit that God can perform miracles for people within false religions, how can miracles serve to confirm the doctrines of Christianity? This is where it becomes important to examine the context of any given miracle. When it comes to the cornerstone miracle of Christianity, the resurrection, Jesus specifically predicts this event as being the one sign that his message is from God. We shall return to this point about the context of a miracle in due course, but for present purposes, suffice to say that the context surrounding Jesus' resurrection makes it capable of justifying belief in Christian doctrine in a way that, say, the miraculous healing of a terminally ill individual within a Muslim or Hindu family would not justify belief in Islam or Hinduism. So to sum up, Hume's arguments in part two, as traditionally understood, are usually fallacious. When they are not fallacious, and his standards of evidence are reasonable, it is no longer clear that no miracles have sufficient evidence to warrant belief. There are, at the very least, Arguments supporting the notion that distinctively Christian miracles, like the resurrection of Jesus, meet these standards, and Hume makes no effort to show otherwise. Consequently, Hume's arguments in part two do
do nothing to cast doubt upon the rationality of belief in miracles. From the time that Hume first published An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, of miracles was instantly controversial. Numerous objections were raised against Hume's arguments by his contemporaries such as William Adams and George Campbell along the lines that I have discussed so far. Nevertheless, in contemporary philosophy, a great many atheist philosophers have claimed that all of these objections miss their mark because they are directed against a serious misunderstanding of Hume's argument. Numerous reinterpretations of Hume's argument have been suggested and defended in recent years. As Colin Brown observes, several philosophers in the Humean tradition have attempted to refine Hume's argument by making it less dogmatic. One way of doing this is to argue that we cannot completely eliminate the possibility that the testimony to any given miracle might be mistaken, fraudulent, or tampered with in some way by those who recorded it or passed it on for posterity. In other words, there are too many factors for human error to permit us to speak of certainty, especially in cases that happened long ago. While there are important differences regarding these various reinterpretations of Hume, they all generally agree that the traditional interpretation of Hume errs by assuming that part one and part two of his essay are supposed to function as two distinct arguments against miracles. The key strategy in defending these alternative readings of Hume have been to insist that part one and part two of the essay actually function as two parts of the same argument. As Robert Fogelin complains, in the last few years, there has been a spate of attacks, bashes might be a better word, aimed at Hume's treatment of miracles. One mistake is to suppose that Hume thinks the argument of part one is adequate in itself to show that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle. A second mistake, which is often tied to the first, is to attribute to Hume an a priori argument against the possibility of a miracle, or an a priori argument against the possibility that testimony can establish the occurrence of a miracle. Specifically, an argument that turns on the conceptual relationships among the laws of nature, violations of laws of nature, and miracles. We can call critics of Hume who make either or both of these mistakes gross misreaders of the text. Gross misreadings of this kind almost always carry with them a wholly unfounded criticism, namely that Hume's argument is circular, perhaps transparently or risibly so. Now the concerns of this video are primarily philosophical, not exegetical. As such, I am not all that concerned in covering the debate over what it might have been that Hume was really trying to say. I will just raise two points in defense of the traditional reading of Hume. First, these alternative interpretations of Hume tend to trivialize his conclusions so much that they no longer appear to do justice to the very strong language which Hume uses throughout the essay. As Timothy McGrew observes, what makes the traditional reading initially attractive? In part, it is Hume's vigorous rhetoric, in particular his strong claims on behalf of his own argument. He boasts at the outset that his argument will, at least with the wise and learned, be an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusion. He characterizes it, albeit indirectly, as decisive. He declares that it will last as long as the world endures, and in a famous passage in part two, he sums up his achievement with the sweeping claim that no human testimony can have such force as to prove a miracle and make it a just foundation for any such system of religion. Here, Hume erects an apparently insurmountable barrier to the support of a miracle by testimony. For even if the testimony amounted to a proof, by which Hume apparently means roughly an argument that we might take as conclusive if it were unopposed, it would be opposed by another proof from universal experience. One that is, as Hume says in part one, as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined, that would annihilate it. This is perhaps the central textual argument for the traditional interpretation, for it suggests that even in the hypothetical best case, there would be nothing left of the case for miracles after the annihilation. As a second point, 
the traditional interpretation of Hume is called the traditional interpretation because it goes back to the earliest critics of Hume's argument, people who were his own contemporaries. Hume was aware of their criticisms of his argument, for he wrote about them. Yet we never find Hume insisting that he has been grossly misunderstood, and that part one and part two were supposed to function as two parts of a singular argument. Again, McGrew points out, Hume's interactions with his contemporary critics also lend some credibility to the conventional reading. Skelton's Deism Revisited, the first published response to Hume's essay, attributes to Hume an argument that would license the rejection of any report of a miracle without examination of the quality of the testimony. Hume did not challenge this interpretation, though it was he who recommended Skelton's book to the publisher. In a letter to Hugh Blair regarding George Campbell's dissertation on miracles, Hume expresses various criticisms, but he does not complain about Campbell's attribution of such an argument to him. It seems, then, that attempts to attribute these newer arguments against miracles to Hume are ill-motivated and lacking a basis in Hume's own writings. One of the more unfortunate facts about the contemporary literature which is critical of Hume's argument is that the critical philosophers are often content to simply show that these modern arguments are not faithful to Hume and leave it there. But even if they are not true to Hume, they are still philosophical arguments against the rationality of belief in miracles, deserving of consideration in their own right. So the remainder of this video serves as an attempt to fill this gap in contemporary apologetics. Contemporary apologists have done an excellent job of showing why Hume's argument against miracles, as traditionally understood, fails. Throughout the subsequent sections of this video, I will attempt to show that more modern arguments against miracles likewise fail. We shall begin by considering an interpretation of Hume's argument as put forward by one of the foremost atheist philosophers of the last century, J. L. Mackey. In his landmark book, The Miracle of Theism, he offers a defense of his interpretation of Hume's argument. He writes, Any problems there may be about establishing laws of nature are neutral between the parties to the present debate. Hume's followers and those who believe in miracles. For both these parties need the notion of a well-established law of nature. The miracle advocate needs it in order to be able to say that the alleged occurrence is a miracle, a violation of natural law by supernatural intervention, no less than Hume needs it for his argument against believing that this event has actually taken place. The defender of a miracle must in effect concede to Hume that the antecedent improbability of this event is as high as it could be, hence that, apart from the testimony, we have the strongest possible grounds for believing that the alleged event did not occur. This event must, by the miracle advocate's own admission, be contrary to a genuine, not merely a supposed, law of nature, and therefore maximally improbable. It is this maximal improbability that the weight of the testimony would have to overcome. We can now put together the various parts of our argument. Where there is some plausible testimony about the occurrence of what would appear to be a miracle, those who accept this as a miracle have the double burden of showing both that the event took place and that it violated the laws of nature. But it will be very hard to sustain this double burden, for whatever tends to show that it would have been a violation of natural law tends, for that very reason, to make it most unlikely that it actually happened. For this very reason, there is a very strong presumption against it having happened, which it is most unlikely that any testimony will be able to outweigh. So right off the bat, Mackey's construal of this argument incurs some of the same difficulties as the traditional interpretation of Hume. Specifically, Mackey adopts Hume's problematic definition of miracles as violations of the laws of nature. As noted earlier, it is doubtful that there is any intelligible sense in which laws of nature can be said to have been violated. It is often not clear which law of nature putative miracles are supposed to have violated, and, per Larmer's account of miracles, the defender of miracles can understand miracles in such a way that they do not, in any sense, violate laws of nature. However, Mackey does not attempt to pit the evidence for the laws of nature against the evidence for miracles as Hume does, so let us put this point aside. 
The real challenge occurs when Mackey concludes that the occurrence of a miracle must be maximally improbable because such events are out of alignment with the usual course of events. But why should we think that mere irregularity, or lack of precedent, renders an event maximally improbable? It appears that Mackey may be confusing the probability of an event relative to our background knowledge with the probability of the same event given our total evidence, including the specific testimonial evidence pertinent to the event in question. It simply does not follow that an event being maximally improbable relative to the former body of knowledge will also be maximally improbable relative to the latter body of evidence. For example, suppose that my grandmother has never before sent me a check for $1,000. This event is quite improbable relative to that background knowledge. But now suppose that numerous members of my family independently tell me that I have received a check in the mail for $1,000 from my grandmother. Even though the event is initially very improbable, the specific evidence simply outweighs that low initial probability, making it perfectly reasonable for me to believe, solely upon testimony, that a hitherto unprecedented event has indeed occurred. As David Johnson concludes, the root idea behind Mackey's discussion that the evidence that a supposed event M is a miracle must at the same time, in the very nature of the fact, as Hume would say, be evidence that M did not really happen, is a sort of Humean cliché on this topic, and is, of course, true. But this point is unhelpful to the Humean, since there seems to be no reason at all to suppose that this evidence that M did not happen cannot be outweighed by the testimonial evidence that M did happen, even when that testimonial evidence is the evidence of a solitary witness. We are still in search of a non-circular argument for Hume's thesis. Mackey makes one further point, namely that even if someone who already believes in God can rationally believe in miracles, it is pointless to use miracles as evidence for theism against the committed atheist. As he says, if one were already a theist and a Christian, it would not be unreasonable to weigh seriously the evidence of alleged miracles as some indication whether some religious sect enjoyed more of the favor of the Almighty. But it is a very different matter if the context is that of a fundamental debate about the truth of theism itself. Here, one party to the debate is initially at least agnostic, and does not yet concede that there is a supernatural power at all. From this point of view, the intrinsic improbability of a genuine miracle, as defined above, is very great, and one or other of the alternative explanations in our fork will always be more likely. That is, either that the alleged event is not miraculous, or that it did not occur, that the testimony is faulty in some way. This entails that it is pretty well impossible that reported miracles should provide a worthwhile argument for theism to those who are initially inclined to atheism or even to agnosticism. But we have already seen reason above to question Mackey's assertion that some other hypothesis will always be more probable than that a miracle has occurred. And so once that obstacle has been removed, it is no longer clear upon what grounds an atheist might legitimately fail to be challenged by substantial testimonial evidence for the miraculous. As long as his atheism is not absolutely certain from some infallible proof, it remains open to falsification which could, in principle, come by means of testimonial evidence for miraculous events. As Joseph Houston observes, As against Mackey's position, it should now be clear, firstly, that it is only by presupposing a conclusively justified atheism or presupposing belief in a non-miracle working God, that you are entitled to adduce with any cogency, say, evidence supporting generalizations about human body density as evidence against Christ having walked on the water. Atheism, which is held for some reason or reasons, may, however, also be vulnerable to reports of putative miracles. A person who denies that a miracle working God exists might find that well-attested weighty reports of miracles require him to review the force of his reasons for his atheism or his belief that there is no miracle-working God and to consider revising his worldview accordingly. His denial that there is a God who works miracles is, presumably, 
either an empirically defeasible hypothesis, or it is proposed as a necessary truth for which supporting reasoning may be mistaken. It is unlikely to be thought simply self-evident. Either way, the emergence of putative miracle reports which cannot satisfactorily be accounted for as species of error puts strain on his worldview. Modern reinterpretations of Hume's argument have chiefly been motivated by the earlier work of Antony Flew. Prior to his conversion to deism, Flew defended a rather unique take on Hume's argument, and no discussion of Humean arguments against miracles would be complete without discussing Flew's interpretation. Flew explains Hume's argument as follows. The criterion of anomological is at the same time a criterion of reliability, and the appropriate way to test for reliability is to subject to strains. If this is correct, then to be justified in asserting that some law of nature in fact obtains, you must know that the appropriate nomological has been thoroughly tested for reliability, whether directly on its own account separately, or indirectly via the testing of some wider structure of theory from which it follows as a consequence. To be in this position is to be both warranted and required to employ this nomological as one of your critical canons. The nomologicals which we know, or think we know, must serve as fundamental canons of our historical criticism. Finding what appears to be historical evidence for an occurrence inconsistent with such a nomological, we must always insist on interpreting that evidence in some other way, for if the nomological is true, then it is physically impossible that any event incompatible with it could have occurred. This might present itself as a conflict between science and history, for on the one side we have what purports to be an historical proof, while on the other the nomological is supposed to have been established by methods which might in a very broad sense be classed as scientific. But the antagonists in this contest are unevenly matched. Certainly the historical evidence could constitute a sufficient reason for re-examining the nomological, and under this re-examination it might fail to sustain its claim to be believed. But if, on the contrary, it survived such testing, then it would be rational, though of course it could always be mistaken, to reject the historical proof. On the single and sufficient ground that we now have the best reasons for insisting that what it purports to prove is in fact impossible. The justification for giving the scientific this ultimate preference here over the historical lies in the nature of the propositions concerned and in the evidence which can be deployed to sustain them. The candidate historical proposition will be particular, often singular, and in the past tense. But just by reason of this very pastness and particularity, it is no longer possible for anyone to examine the subject directly for himself. All that there is left to examine is the present detritus of the past, which includes the physical records of testimony. This detritus can be interpreted as evidence only in the light of our present knowledge or presumed knowledge of men and things, a category which embraces, although it is certainly not exhausted by, our stock of general nomologicals. Surely this is and must always be the fundamental principle of historical interpretation. And in one of his papers discussing his reading of Hume, Flew succinctly summarizes the argument as follows. The basic propositions are, first, that the present relics of the past cannot be interpreted as historical evidence at all unless we presume that the same fundamental regularities obtained then as still obtained today. Second, that in trying as best he may to determine what actually happened, the historian must employ as criteria all his present knowledge or presumed knowledge of what is probable or improbable, possible or impossible. And third, that since miracle has to be defined in terms of practical impossibility, the application of these criteria inevitably precludes proof of a miracle. Flew's argument is as ingenious as it is perplexing. It is perplexing in that Flew appears to assume that all events must be capable of description by the laws of nature, such that were we to discover an event which was not describable by them, we should revise our understanding of the laws of nature in order to include the anomalous event. But such an understanding of the laws of nature is problematic from the perspective of the defender of miracles. As McGrew points out, 
The most obvious rejoinder here is that the believer in miracles does not generally believe that there are no dependable regularities in the physical world. It is in the nature of a miracle to be an exception to the ordinary course of nature. The feared undermining of the principles of historical inquiry is, therefore, an illusion generated by exaggerating the scale on which the order of nature would be disrupted were a miracle actually to occur. Flew's argument is ingenious insofar as his suggestion that putative miracle claims might cause us to actually revise our understanding of what we had previously taken to be laws of nature would make it virtually impossible to identify any event as a miracle, even if the event really occurred. In other words, even if one were to prove that Jesus rose from the dead, Flew's suggestion is that this would not pressure us to conclude that a miracle has therefore occurred. Rather, it would oblige us to revise our current understanding of the laws of nature according to which dead men do not come back to life. One difficulty with Flew's account is that it makes the notion of laws of nature useless and nearly unintelligible. For if laws of nature are merely descriptive of whatever in fact occurs, as opposed to descriptive of natural regularities, then the term lacks any determinate content. There really are no clear things we can point to as examples of laws of nature. Implausible as this implication is, it must be admitted that it is ultimately an argument from consequence. Even if Flew accepts this difficult implication, a question remains regarding how the defender of miracles can distinguish miracles from anomalies. And here it will be helpful to recognize that the context of a miracle is key to identifying it as such. Miracles are supposed to function as signs, usually from God, and as such they must be playing some role in confirming a divine message, as Norman Geisler explains. An anomaly is also an unusual event in the sense that there is no known natural explanation for it. But there is where the similarities end. Anomalies have no divine purpose and no truth claims connected to them. So an anomaly is atheological, has no theological truth claim connected to it, and ateleological, has no divine purpose associated with it, such as confirming a new revelation from God. This is why there is clear religious significance to an event like Jesus' resurrection, whereas there would be no such significance if Queen Elizabeth were to abruptly return to life tomorrow. In the case of Jesus, we are dealing with an individual who claimed divine authority for himself and predicted his own resurrection as the confirmation of the truth of his message. So when his resurrection occurs, we have context to make sense of this event. Jesus' resurrection represents God's approval on this man and his message. It functions as a vindication of Jesus' claims to divine authority. Conversely, there is no such context in the case of Queen Elizabeth, leaving the event of her resurrection an interesting curiosity and nothing more. As J.P. Moreland and William Lane Craig observe, it might be urged that if a purportedly miraculous event were demonstrated to have occurred, we should conclude that the event occurred in accordance with unknown natural causes and laws. The question is, what serves to distinguish a genuine miracle from a mere scientific anomaly? Here, the religio-historical context of the event becomes crucial. A miracle without a context is inherently ambiguous. But if a purported miracle occurs in a significant religio-historical context, then the chances of it being a genuine miracle are increased. In Jesus' case, moreover, his miracles and resurrection ostensibly took place in the context of, and as the climax to, his own unparalleled life and teachings, and produced so profound an effect on his followers that they worshipped him as Lord. We therefore have good reason to regard Jesus' resurrection, if it occurred, as truly miraculous. There would also seem to be an intractable inconsistency with Influ's basic approach to history. For while he allows that a sufficiently strong historical argument for a miracle might compel us to revise our current understanding of what is naturally possible, he also claims that we must assume that whatever nomologicals are known today also held in the past. But Flew cannot have his cake and eat it too. Either we begin historical investigation presupposing that no event which cannot be described by our current understanding of the laws of nature have occurred, 
which effectively assumes that miracles do not occur and so begs the question, or else we do allow sufficiently strong historical evidence to compel us to revise our understanding of what sorts of events can occur, in which case, given the aforementioned criteria for distinguishing anomalies from miracles, it is unwarranted to assume that all events must be describable by natural laws. David Johnson highlights this inconsistency on Flew's part masterfully, saying, When Flew says that a law-like candidate is confirmed, does he mean merely that it is exceedingly probable relative to a body of inductive evidence which is large, wide-ranging, and thoroughly sought out, or does he mean that the law candidate is exceedingly probable relative to all of our available and relevant information? If flu means the latter, then it is uncontroversial that a critical historian should regard the set of confirmed nomologicals in this wide sense of confirmed, currently available to the scientific community, as being the best guide to what the true laws of nature are. But the uncontroversial point above is completely unhelpful to any Humean argument against the credibility of the miraculous, since the crucial claim that a certain nomological, which an alleged miracle would violate, is confirmed in this wide sense, that is exceedingly probable relative to all of our available and relevant information, including the testimony to the miracle, begs the question at issue. On the other hand, if, when Flew speaks of a law candidate as being confirmed, he means only the former description above, then he has given us no reason whatever to believe that a critical historian should regard the set of confirmed nomologicals, in this narrow sense of confirmed, currently available to the scientific community as being, in all cases, the best guide to what the true laws of nature are. Such claims as Flew's would again beg the question at issue. For why cannot, say the solitary testimony to a miracle, rightly persuade us that such and such a nomological is simply not true, however confirmed in this narrow sense it might be? Within contemporary philosophy, Robert Fogelin has perhaps done more work towards motivating a reconsideration of the traditional interpretation of Hume's argument. In his 2003 book, A Defense of Hume on Miracles, Fogelin suggests a rather modest interpretation of Hume, according to which Hume's argument in Part 1 merely establishes that there is a low prior probability on miracles, and Hume's argument in Part 2 establishes that the testimonial evidence for religious miracles is of poor quality and so does not overcome the low prior probability. As he explains, In short, for Hume, it is an empirical fact amply illustrated by history that testimony concerning religious miracles is notoriously unreliable. On the basis of this general fact about the quality of such testimony, the wise reasoner has ample grounds for rejecting it. This does not mean that, on a priori grounds, no amount of testimony could ever establish the occurrence of a religious miracle. Hume's point, however, is that the local sect-serving testimony that has been offered on behalf of religious miracles falls hopelessly short of standards of testimony. Yet even if the standards for testimony on behalf of miracles are high, they remain, in principle, satisfiable. Through probabilistic reasoning, Part 1 fixes the appropriate level of scrutiny for evaluating testimony with respect to miracles. Part 2 considers the quality of the testimony that has hitherto been brought forth in support of religious miracles and concludes that it comes nowhere near to meeting the appropriate standards. More strongly, an examination of historical records shows such a consistent pattern of ignorance, deceit, and credulity that the wise reasoner is fully justified in rejecting all testimony given in support of a miracle intended to serve as the foundation of a system of religion. Leaving exegetical considerations aside, taken on its own, Fogelin's argument reaches a rather trivial conclusion. Virtually everyone grants that belief in a miracle requires better evidence than might be required for believing in other sorts of events. The defender of miracles can merely restate the objections to Hume's argument which have already been covered when discussing part two of his essay. The defender of miracles simply disagrees that all testimony regarding miracles is undercut in the way part two of the essay suggests, moving the dialectic into a consideration of the quality of the evidence in favor of some particular miracles. 
the very thing which Hume appears to want to avoid. On Fogelin's reading of Hume, the argument simply has no teeth. As Timothy McGrew says in an excellent review of Fogelin's book, if Fogelin is right and Hume is not offering an argument in principle against the competency of testimony to establish a miracle in part one, what is he doing and why should we think it subtle, powerful, or even original? Hume's maxim is, at best, a trivial truism, as contemporary critics like Campbell remarked, it comes to nothing more than the statement that the truth of the event, given the testimony, must be more likely than its falsehood. The principle that an improbable event calls for high standards of evidence was granted by many of the moderate evidentialists during the Deus controversy, so this can hardly be considered to be Hume's original contribution. Taking his cue from the work of Robert Fogelin, Alexander George has offered one of the more recent reinterpretations of Hume's argument. In his 2016 book, The Everlasting Check, George defends a unique interpretation of Hume's argument. He takes part one of Hume's essay to defend the first premise of a master argument, and part two to defend the second premise. Taken together, the argument looks like this. First Lemma. If the falsehood of testimony on behalf of an alleged miraculous event is not more miraculous than the event itself, then it is not rational to believe in the occurrence of that event on the basis of that testimony. Second Lemma. The falsehood of testimony on behalf of an alleged miraculous event of a religious nature is not more miraculous than the event itself. Hume's Theorem. It is not rational to believe on the basis of testimony that a miracle of a religious nature has occurred. Following Fogelin, George insists that Hume's argument is not intended to be an a priori argument against the possibility of rationally believing in miracles. Rather, the argument of part two is essential to Hume's overarching case. As he explains, it is important to keep this in mind that a proof consists of empirical evidence of a very high order. For otherwise, recalling that a miracle is a violation of a law of nature, that is, a transgression of a law-like statement for which we have a proof, one might again be tempted to interpret Hume as making an a priori argument against miracles. Rather, what we have arrived at is a more accurate characterization of what he takes miracles to be, namely events that violate a law-like claim that our observations leave beyond doubt. George's really unique contribution to this debate can be found in the third chapter of his book, where he argues that it is self-defeating to believe in a miracle, inasmuch as miracles, if accepted, undermine whatever reason we had to believe in the very laws of nature which are needed to recognize them. Hence, we could have no reason to believe in miracles, even if they actually occurred. As he explains, if one comes to think that, on balance, the evidence supports that Jesus was resurrected, then one must judge that, on balance, it tells against dead men remain dead, the general claim with which it conflicts. But then one can no longer view Jesus' resurrection as a miracle, since there is no longer a proven general claim with which it conflicts. In short, if one judges that an event heretofore taken to be a miracle has occurred, one must immediately retract the appellation. In a sense, therefore, it is trivially true that it is not rational to believe that a miracle has occurred. One cannot judge that an event has occurred which, one judges, conflicts with a presumptive law that one now has no reason to think is disconfirmed. It is worth noting that, despite his initial insistence in chapter 1 that Hume's argument is not an a priori argument against the rationality of belief in miracles, it is very hard to see how George's interpretation of Hume does not conclude with an a priori argument in chapter 3. As Robert Larmer points out in a scathing review of George's book, it is significant that in this passage, George contradicts his earlier claim that Hume was concerned only to demonstrate that it is not reasonable to believe in religious miracles, and instead presents Hume's argument as simply an attempt to demonstrate a conditional claim. In any event, it remains true that, on George's interpretation, the term miracle is a pseudo-concept no more meaningful than married bachelor. Despite his insistence that there is no a priori element to Hume's argument, it is difficult to avoid the conclusion that, 
on George's interpretation, Hume remains guilty of stacking the definitional deck. But returning to George's actual argument, it turns on the idea that if one believes in a miracle, then this undercuts whatever justification they might have to believe in the laws of nature, and if one cannot justifiably believe in the laws of nature, then one cannot justifiably believe in a miracle. We again see an attempt to pit the evidence for a miracle against the evidence for the laws of nature, as though one cannot affirm both. We have already detailed problems with trying to define miracles as violations of the laws of nature. For example, Timothy McGrew observes that, it becomes difficult to say in some cases just which natural laws are being violated by the event in question. That dead men stay dead is a widely observed fact, but it is not, in the ordinary scientific use of the term, a law of nature that dead men stay dead. The laws involved in the decomposition of a dead body are all at a much more fundamental level, at least at the level of biochemical and thermodynamic processes, and perhaps at the level of interactions of fundamental particles. But even if we leave the definition of miracle aside, is it true that there is a conflict between the propositions that dead men stay dead and the proposition that Jesus rose from the dead? It depends upon how extensive the former statement is supposed to be. If George only means that dead men usually stay dead, or that dead men naturally stay dead, then there is no conflict, because the claim is that Jesus' resurrection was an unusual and supernatural event. On the other hand, if George means that dead men always stay dead, then clearly there is a conflict between this proposition and the proposition that Jesus rose from the dead. Equally clear is the fact that, on this interpretation, George's putative law of nature is patently question-begging against miracles, for one can only say that it is a law of nature that dead men stay dead if they already know that Jesus did not rise. In short, then, George's claim that belief in miracles is self-defeating only appears to have force due to his intolerable vagueness. Once George's putative law of nature is made explicit, it becomes clear that either the premise that there is a conflict between a miracle and a law of nature is false, and so there is no need to choose one over the other, or else George is simply begging the question. Either way, George will have failed to sustain his thesis that belief in miracles is self-defeating. Sloan Lee sums things up nicely, saying, It looks like George is just another iteration in this long line of defenders of this faulty argument. Further, it is not difficult to show that the argument is faulty. Laws of nature have implicit centris perubis clauses attached to them, so that all A's are B's really amounts to something along the lines of, given that all and only natural conditions apply, all A's are B's. Of course, the miracle enthusiast doesn't need to maintain both that all A's are B's and that there is an exception to this true universal generalization, which is, of course, a contradictory thing to say. Rather, the miracle enthusiast is free to say that all other things being equal, all A's are B's, but here is a case, or a miracle, in which not all other things are equal. That is, here is a case in which it is not true that all and only natural conditions apply. But Hume's modern defenders are not quite finished yet. The most recent monograph defending Hume, as far as I know, is William Vanderberg's 2019 book, David Hume on Miracles, Evidence, and Probability. Embarking upon a similar project to Fogelin and George, Vanderberg argues that there has been quite a bit of misreading Hume over the past 270 years or so. His interpretation of the main argument of Part 1 is fairly traditional, as he says, Part of what is at issue in Hume's examination of miracles is whether testimony is likely, in practice, ever to be able to provide sufficient warrant to overthrow a well-established law. With his negative answer, Hume is, in effect, specifying the conditions under which it would be empirically justified to put aside a well-established law. The falsity of the testimony would have to be a greater miracle, that is, would have to be more likely than the falsity of the law. In this respect, there is an interesting similarity between Hume's case against miracles and the fourth of Newton's rules for the study of natural philosophy. Let me put the point another way we may ask a general methodological question. 
what kind of evidence would be required in order to justify the rejection of a well-established law of nature. Both Newton and Hume set the epistemic bar high. They think we should almost never overturn established laws because the epistemic burden that is met in order to establish the law in the first place is extremely high. Nevertheless, Vanderberg takes it that Hume is not ruling out the possibility of accruing sufficient evidence to warrant belief in a miracle. It is just that the evidence would have to be very strong. This is where the argument of part two becomes important for Vanderberg's reading, for it is here that he takes Hume to argue that the quality of testimonial evidence for miracles comes nowhere near to meeting that high standard. As he explains, Hume's argument here is relatively straightforward. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature. We construct laws of nature on the dual basis of a firm and unalterable experience, that is, from an observed constant conjunction of event types, an exceptionless regularity, plus an expectation of the mind that the future will resemble the past. The depth and breadth of the exceptionless regularity of past experience gives the strongest kind of warrant possible to the belief that the law will continue to hold in the same way in the future. It is not that the evidence demonstrates with certainty that the law is true, it is just that no empirical claim can possibly have stronger evidence than what we have with regard to those things we call laws of nature. Testimony, the evidence offered in opposition to the exceptionless regularity, is known to be fallible and is especially suspect in cases of reports of miracles because of the likelihood of deception or misperception. Thus, the weight of evidence derived from testimony about a purported exception to a law of nature, in fact, will never come close to the weight of evidence from experience that the law will be regular in all cases. Vanderberg's understanding of Hume's argument, far more than either Fogelin's or George's, depends upon the understanding of miracles as violations of the laws of nature, such that to accept a miracle, one must reject the law of nature which it violates. But defenders of miracles wish to maintain both that there are laws of nature and that miracles happen. Thus, by Vanderberg trying to get the proponent of miracles to argue against certain laws of nature, the defender of miracles must conclude that something has gone wrong. As Norman Geisler says, while theists sometimes describe miracles as contrary to nature, they do not mean against nature, but rather beyond it. They mean miracles are contrary to the way things normally work, not contrary to the way things actually are. When a miracle occurs, nature is not disrupted from its regular patterns. As I have repeatedly pointed out throughout this video, what has gone wrong with arguments such as Vanderberg's is his defining miracles in a way which places them in competition with the laws of nature. But if we just accept Larmer's account of miracles as events on which the laws of nature are simply silent, then there is no force in Vanderberg's version of the argument. Vanderberg shows awareness of Larmer's work, and yet astonishingly, despite having an entire chapter discussing the relationship of laws of nature to miracles, Vanderberg never once addresses Larmer's incisive criticisms of defining miracles as violations of natural laws. Jordan Howard Sobel is perhaps the greatest atheist philosopher of the modern age. His magnum opus is a work entitled Logic and Theism, and it is, in my opinion, among the most challenging books that a theist can read. It's been called the final boss of atheism and an acid bath for theism. In chapter 8 of his most impressive monograph, Sabel defends a Bayesian interpretation of Hume's argument against miracles. The chapter, as well as his formal version of the argument, is filled with symbolic logic and Bayesian equations. For the sake of keeping this video as accessible as possible, I will try to avoid those aspects as much as possible and translate Sabel's argument for a wider audience. Sabel writes, For Hume, M asserts what would, in a person's view, would be a miracle only if M is logically possible and there is what Hume would term a proof for this person against M that has moved him to view it as naturally impossible. A firm and unalterable contrary experience provides a person with such a proof against M 
if and only if it has in fact given rise, causal, not justificational notion, in this person to a credence m that is represented by such an extraordinarily small number. According to Hume, a person views a logical possibility as a miracle only if he views it as a violation of a law of nature and so views it as a natural impossibility. We have such views. Hume considers them to be philosophically suspect and incapable of fully face-saving analyses in terms of ideas derived from experience, but he thinks that they are natural and indeed irrepressible views for everyone including skeptics such as himself when they are not engaged in their skepticism, in which they are usually not engaged. There is, he might say, a sense in which we cannot do without them. He might say that although we do not for any theoretical or practical purposes need them, we cannot psychologically avoid them in our ordinary thinking. The proposal I am making for reading of miracles is that such views, scare quotes in deference to Hume's philosophical suspicions, be accorded distinctive treatment and a probabilistic representation of a credence state with all and only views of natural impossibilities having infinitesimal probabilities in the representation. Similarly, all and only things viewed as natural necessity will have probabilities that are, though less than, infinitely close to one. Key to Sobel's interpretation of Hume's argument is the assignment of infinitesimal numbers to the prior probability of a miracle. An infinitesimal number is an infinitely small number such that its absolute value will be smaller than any positive real number. Since, for Sobel, the prior probability that a miracle will occur is some infinitesimally small number, the degree of confirmation that is conferred by testimonial evidence is so small that, in the final analysis, the overall probability that a miracle has occurred will remain approximately the same as the low prior probability. For this reason, the only kind of evidence which could justify a miracle would be evidence that is approaching a probability of one, that is, evidence which virtually guarantees that a miracle has occurred. All of that to say, if Sabel is describing the prior probabilities for miracles correctly, then the prospect of confirming a miracle through finite types of evidence, including testimony, is doomed from the start, since the finite accumulation of infinitesimally small numbers will never add up to a non-infinitesimal number. An initial worry about Sabel's argument regards what exactly it might mean to say that the prior probability of an event's occurring is infinitesimally small. It is not readily apparent that we have a clear enough conception of infinitesimal numbers to assign them to any event. As John DePoe observes, if Sobel's probability syntax cannot be understood as a very small yet finite probability, such as the atom lottery, and it cannot be rendered meaningful under the description of an infinitely membered set of outcomes, such as an infinite lottery, then it seems that there is no way to give a meaningful interpretation to an infinitesimal probability. Perhaps there is some halfway house between the probabilities involved in the atom lottery and the infinite lottery, but the onus rests on Sobel to show a clearer mathematical and probability theoretic explanation of how infinitesimal probabilities are to be understood. But laying this issue aside, the real challenge for Sabel regards what justification he has for assigning an infinitesimal prior probability to miracles in the first place. Sabel uncharacteristically merely gestures towards an answer to this critical question. It appears to have something to do with miracles being natural impossibilities. But if, by this, Sabel means to say something like that miracles cannot occur because they are physically impossible, and the physical is causally closed, then he clearly begs the question. As DePoe observes, at the beginning of this passage, Sobel relies heavily on the notion of natural impossibility. Perhaps he means to suggest that everyone is compelled to recognize the causal closure of the physical universe, but this is not going to be sufficient to justify assigning an infinitesimal value to the probability that a miracle occurs. First, if causal closure holds for the physical universe, then the probability that a miracle will occur is zero. Of course, to know that the universe is causally closed, one would have to know that God does not exist, 
or that even God cannot causally interact with the physical world. So this route of justifying infinitesimal probabilities would turn out to be question-begging at best. Depoe goes on to say, Maybe Sibel means that one has a probabilistically strong case for the causal closure of the physical world. I will call this inductive skepticism against miracles. Yet, even if such a strong case could be established, the result would surely not be so strong as to assign the probability that a miracle will occur an infinitesimal value. At best, such a proof would designate the probability that a miracle will occur to be some finite, although very low, probability. Furthermore, since the theist maintains that the miracle occurs by supernatural means, rather than by natural means, the fact that miracles are naturally impossible does not seem relevant at all. Just as saying that rolling a three on a six-sided die is evenly impossible, impossible given that an even number is rolled, would have no significant bearing on rolling a three, unless one already thought that all dice rolls were restricted to the even numbers. Only if one assumes that miracles must occur by natural means, or that all events are natural events, can one assign an infinitesimal probability to an event on the grounds that it is a natural impossibility. To do this would beg crucial claims against one defending miracles. It seems, then, that there are no grounds for Sibel assigning an infinitesimally low prior probability to miracles. One might try to modify Sibel's argument by dropping this aspect of it and merely positing that there is some finite but still very low prior probability on a miracle occurring. However, once this move has been made, there will be no way to avoid the conclusion that finite means of evidence, such as testimony, can eventually accrue with sufficient strength to overcome the low prior probability. As Lydia McGrew points out, it is, someone might point out, possible for evidence to play some rational role without being conclusive. The distinction between an argument that provides some confirmation for a hypothesis and an argument that provides sufficient confirmation for belief is an important one. Perhaps those who wish to relegate the final conclusion that a miracle has taken place to a special worldview applications realm tenanted by philosophers and theologians, but not by historians, should say that historical evidence can be, to some degree, positively relevant to the conclusion that a miracle has happened, but can never justify that conclusion. The trouble with this line of thought is that it is utterly unsupported by any defensible epistemological principle. If evidence can rationally confirm a proposition, it is always in principle possible that there should be a sufficient amount of evidence to make it rational to believe the proposition, and even irrational to disbelieve it. Conversely, if evidence can never, in the nature of the case, make it rational to believe a proposition, if that proposition can be believed only by a sort of faith that goes beyond evidence, then evidence must not be able rationally to confirm that proposition. There is no principled reason to permit ordinary epistemic confirmation for a miracle claim only to some weak level, and then to declare that, however much evidence we receive, it can never confirm the conclusion past that point. Confirmation is confirmation, and it is all of a piece. And Timothy McGrew, with characteristic flair, adds, the cumulative weight of independent testimony can overcome any finite presumption against a miracle. Or, in layman's terms, Hume is wrong. Lastly, let us consider an interpretation of Hume's argument as set forward by one of the brightest young atheist philosophers of our day, namely Arif Ahmed. Ahmed explains his understanding of Hume as follows. Consider the two competing hypotheses A and B, where A says that the resurrection took place as stated, and B says that the report of it is a complete fabrication. Should the evidence leave us more confident of A or of B? We need to answer two questions. One, which of A and B is antecedently more likely? Two, which of A and B makes our evidence more likely to have been observed? It is very easy to answer two, so I will take that first. Clearly, A and B both make it very likely that we should observe the evidence that we actually do observe. This evidence is someone's linguistic report of death and reanimation. That is just what we would have expected to see if those things had actually happened. 
but it is also just what we would have expected him to say if he had decided to invent a story of this sort. What about one? Prior to someone's testimony, should we think it more likely A, that a person really came back from the dead, or B, that someone should pretend that this has happened? Obviously, we should think that B is vastly more likely. Here is one sort of reason for thinking so. There are, or have been, tens of thousands of religions, each claiming its own miracle. Everyone accepts that, at most, one of them is true. So everyone will agree, first, that there have been, at most, a small number of miracles in the history of the world, and second, that there have been many more false claims to this effect. In short, the neo humean argument is as follows. If somebody testifies to a miracle, this could equally be because a miracle took place or because of deceit, ignorance, or illusion. Deceit, ignorance, and illusion are, on any view, vastly more frequent than any kind of miracle. Testimonial evidence is, therefore, practically no basis at all for any kind of religious belief. There are, however, numerous problems with Ahmed's argument. In the first place, he seems to think that the only sort of evidence for miracles consists in the bare fact that someone says that a miracle has occurred, but this is just not so. The specific people who are making the claim, along with various facts about them, including their general track record of trustworthiness, their position to know what they are talking about, as well as specific details about the character of their testimony, are all pieces of evidence which need to be considered when assessing a miracle claim. The statement, someone said that Jesus rose from the dead, is clearly not on evidential par with the statement, someone who personally knew Jesus says that they saw him alive again and went on to willingly suffer and die for that claim. As Charity Anderson and Alex Proust point out, we need to make a distinction between the bare fact that someone has testified to a miracle and the rich tapestry of detail surrounding that testimony that we sometimes have available. It may well be that even a theist would not be reasonable in believing in a miracle based on the bare fact that someone or other has testified to it. But we argue that we need to examine the character, track record, and motivations of the testifier, as well as contextual features, such as whether the miracle appears to support religious claims that we have independent reason to think are false. Ahmed has not shown that such an examination cannot result in a rational conclusion in favor of a miracle given appropriate and reasonable background beliefs. Similarly, Joseph Houston says, Yet the mere fact that what is reported is anomalous will not on its own determine the assessment, as Hume thought it should. Rather, that fact most probably in conjunction with further facts, for example about the disposition or knowledgeability of the author of the report, may be set against experience of other similar reports of anomalous events. In this way, then, experience can guide the assessment of reports of putative miracles. Ahmed is also mistaken in thinking that adherents of a specific religion must reject the occurrence of miraculous events within all other religions. There is no reason for a Christian, for example, to deny that the Christian God can perform miracles for people of other faiths so long as these miracles do not confirm any points of doctrine which would conflict with Christianity. Again, Anderson and Proust argue that to say that a religion is not true is presumably to say that at least one of its central claims is not true. But to say that a religion is not true is not to say that all of its claims, or even all of its central claims, are untrue. We distinguish between miracles corroborative of doctrine and other miracles. There is no difficulty in holding that non-corroborative miracles occur in a multiplicity of religions. And while given classical theism, it is unlikely that there would be miracles corroborative of false doctrines, a miracle in a religion that includes a false central claim could nevertheless be corroborative of some other claim. Thus we should not, at the outset, dismiss miracle reports in all, but at most one religion, without examination of the specific testimonies and surrounding context, as Ahmed appears to do. And lastly, Ahmed's comments about preferring the hypothesis that someone is pretending that a resurrection has occurred appear to indicate that he believes that the probability that some event is a miracle should be calculated 
solely by counting how many times that sort of event has been a miracle, as opposed to something else in the past. This appears to commit him to an odd sort of frequentism with respect to probability theory, but there are numerous well-known problems with this approach to probability theory, notably the reference class problem. As Alan Hayek explains, a well-known objection to any version of frequentism is that relative frequencies must be relativized to a reference class. Consider a probability concerning myself that I care about, say my probability of living to age 80. I belong to the class of males, the class of non-smokers, the class of philosophy professors who have two vowels in their surname. Presumably the relative frequency of those who live to the age of 80 varies across most of these reference classes. Instead, there is my probability qua male, my probability qua non-smoker, my probability qua male non-smoker, and so on. This is an example of the so-called reference class problem for frequentism. And the same problem arises for assessing any putative miracle claim. Upon what non-arbitrary grounds can Ahmed select miracle claims generally as the reference class against which, say, testimony pertaining to Jesus' resurrection should be measured? Why shouldn't the reference class be testimony about people seeing other people instead? If that were the reference class, it's unclear that this will favor a negative assessment of the testimony pertaining to Jesus' resurrection. And even if we accepted miracle claims as the reference class, given the aforementioned point about the acceptability of Christians accepting certain miracles within other religious traditions, it's no longer clear that Ahmed is free to assume that most miracle claims have been false without begging the question. Timothy McGrew concludes, Lack of analogy is, at best, an obscure reason for concluding that an event is maximally improbable. For if strength of analogy is a critical determinant in a rational agent's probability function, then he should be comparably skeptical regarding all spectacular scientific discoveries. And that is absurd. The solution, so it seems to me, is to reject the frequentist approach to probability theory. We cannot determine the likelihood that some event has occurred merely by counting how many times similar events have occurred. One must also consider the quality of the evidence bearing on the case in question. But, of course, were Ahmed to engage in that conversation, then he would be doing the very thing which Hume's argument is supposed to help him avoid. This video has surveyed much of the literature surrounding Hume's famous argument against miracles. We have seen that the traditional interpretation of the argument in Part 1 fails due to an untenable definition of a miracle, as well as an overly simplistic application of inductive reasoning. We have seen that the arguments of Part 2 are either question-begging or irrelevant in many cases. Additionally, we have surveyed seven modern attempts to resurrect Hume's argument and seen that, in every case, they either succumb to similar objections or else trivialize the argument to the point that it is no longer saying anything controversial or anything interesting. Obviously, none of this proves that any miracles have actually occurred, but it does clear a path so that we can examine the evidence for miracles. There is nothing in principle which would preclude a person from having a justified belief that a miracle has occurred.